The time has come. We cannot wait any longer. We can't continue to push the opportunities that we have aside to evolve as a society in the way that we interact with the natural world and the way that it impacts human health and wellness. Mother Earth has been here supporting us and there's no reason why we can't offer her back the same love that she's been giving us for a long time. I care about sustainability for a lot of reasons. Um, I have two kids and I don't want the planet that they inherit to be worse than the planet that I inherited, that my generation inherited. The time is now. We have to take action as an industry and as a society to help the planet. I think the biggest challenge that we face is continuing to bring awareness at a level where everyone understands. I think there is a lot of bipartisanism in the way that we approach things, and that generally makes people want to put sustainability in one of those buckets. And it just doesn't fit. It's not a part of anything with political or things that divide us. Because if there's one thing like we all have to unify around, it's the way we treat ourselves and our planet. Everything that we live today is truly at risk if we do nothing. Heat waves where I live in Washington, D.C. will increase by 300%. We won't be able to go outside and enjoy outside as much. I've been an advocate since I was young. I mean, since, you know, age 10 or 11 when I decided to publish a newsletter about sustainability and send it to all my relatives. I care about sustainability because I believe it is morally the right thing to be doing. Sustainability should be important to us all. I truly believe it impacts everything that we do, no matter what career you're in, no matter what you do with your life. Sustainability is not just the next big story, but our responsibility. All of the things that we do have an impact on our natural world, and that in turn has an impact on how we survive as humans. The built environment, new construction, and what happens at the end of that are some of the biggest contributors to greenhouse gases. Even if we can't solve it all, we can make significant impact by focusing on this one area and doing it thoroughly. So the design community has you know, a big role in helping push uh, sustainability within the built environment. They're at the crux of the beginning of that process. Everyone has responsibility in it, so let's just make that super clear, right? We're not starting from scratch. There's so much that's already been done ahead of us. There have been some great progress made in evolving the way that we actually make concrete. So there's been using recycled glass poslin as a replacement for cement. That's a one-on-one -on -one carbon trade. It's learning what has been successful from other industries and what hasn't so that we can make sure that lighting industry is evolving in the right direction and trying to face some of those roadblocks ahead of time. It's important that lighting is considered part of the conversation for healthy spaces. But as an industry, I think lighting is way behind in trying to realize the opportunities to create a more sustainable practices and a more sustainable product. Lighting is one of those segments of the industry that has made great strides with energy conservation, but we don't see those same strides in material transparency. The conversation should start with making sure that people understand why this is important, why this matters, and that they are aware of the different ways that we can quantify this in the lighting industry with the different labels and certifications that are available. The documentation is important because it helps us as designers understand what we're putting into the project and what potential impacts those materials and product systems have on the greater environment. I think we should be focusing our energy on requiring DECLARE and HBDs as a written part of our spec. In the case of a health product declaration, we can verify if a material is free of known toxins, won't cause human health issues. In the case of an environmental product declaration, we know how much impact that product's manufacturing has on 
carbon emissions. Declare label is another form of material ingredient reporting that reports on where a product comes from, what it's made of, and where it goes at the end of its life. Now we're moving further around, you know, to understand, okay, how can we make an environmental product declaration? You know, these are really important um, steps that you need to take. How do you create a pathway to do that? Don't think you have the best idea and, and try to sell it to everybody. Do the research, understand it, and then you can come up and prioritize the, the best steps to go forward. In terms of product transparency, trust a third-party verification process. Don't try to do it yourself. You have to trust these third-party verifiers uh, who create the relationships, get you the information, be prepared to make changes if you hear information that you don't want to hear, that this particular part isn't you know, made in, in the right way or of the right materials, and then you've got to adjust, and your team can do that. But I think third-party verification is a great process to hold yourself accountable in the right way. Designers should be asking product reps where the products come from. They should be asking what the products are made of. And they should be asking if the manufacturer as a company has environmental or social responsibility goals that they're following up on. It could be anything from carbon neutrality to um, fair and living wages. I often tell people, if you think about sustainability as an ice cream sundae, sustainability can't be the sprinkles. It's gotta be one of the key ingredients in the ice cream. At the end of the day, you can't retrofit a project to make it sustainable. It has to be something that's throughout. It, it has to be in its, in its DNA. The earlier that I can initiate those conversations, the more momentum we're going to have. There's nothing uniquely expensive about being sustainable. It really is a thought exercise. It's making sure your engineer, when he starts to design that product, is thinking about it. It's not something you can think about at the end, and it's definitely not something you can think about after it ships. If you do those things, you're gonna be saving money you know, on material. You're going to probably save money on damage if you have the right sustainable packaging. You are going to feel better because you are working with vendors who are paying a living wage and treating their workers well. And that's a really important part of sustainable manufacturing is you have to take care of the people who are making it. And then at the end of it, you know, coming up with those easy ways for people to reuse, recycle, and, and not create any more waste at the end of life of that product. Most of the time, when a client comes to us with a sustainability goal in mind, we can help mitigate the cost when we're talking about it early and upfront, and we incorporate the best decision making we can throughout the entire design process. Almost every product that we've seen that has come on the market has come down in costs as more and more people have gotten comfortable specifying, installing, and managing those products. It doesn't necessarily cost more to be sustainable, but it does require a little bit of extra time right now to do the digging to find the information that we need. This is where that whole collaborative delivery method is vital because then it's not just the responsibility of the design team, it's us and everybody else working with the design team throughout the entire process. We still have a long way to go to driving transparency and the demand for that. I believe that the more and more we continue to drive that up, the more affordable it will become. Uh, there's lots of great examples. I'll give you one in the lighting industry, LED lighting. Uh, it used to be a significant capital expenditure versus you know, existing lighting um, technology. And that's not the case nowadays. Every client doesn't come to us with a sustainability goal, but that doesn't mean it can't be part of the project. It's all about how you talk about the strategies. It's not hard to design a sustainable project, but the amount of documentation and the amount of information out there that designers currently can sift through can make it for a very daunting task. Now we're actually asking the questions and getting the answers about where is this material made? Are people being paid living and fair wages for it? What's the embodied carbon of it related to transporting this material across oceans to my project? There's all these new layers that we really need to consider. Some of the challenges that are a little bit more global include lack of documentation. 
We rely on the manufacturers to be constantly creating and updating these, these documents that we need to, to, to collect. So if design firms want to improve their environmental performance, some small steps that they can start taking today are definitely benchmarking, looking at what they're doing right now and measuring it. You can't improve what you don't measure. So look at energy, water, material health, etc. I would also suggest asking the right questions. Just by talking about it, you're raising awareness among your staff, raising awareness among your, your clients. And lastly, I would say make sure when you have a project kickoff meeting with all of your design consultants to make sure that sustainability is a topic that is discussed, not just in terms of certifications like meeting checklists, but also holistically how can systems thinking be used to um, have one aspect of a project inform others. The role of the designer is, is so impactful. I mean, we have so much power that I think the majority of us are not aware of. Our vote, our specification vote is immensely powerful. I would love to be in a product presentation and hear other people asking about a manufacturer's stance on material transparency. Do they offer any products with declare labels or HBDs? Do they offer PVC-free wiring for their products or is that an option for an ad service? Are there any take-back programs that they can tell us about? Are there any other initiatives that they want to share with us so that we're more aware of their values? I think manufacturers are a little bit intimidated because this is new this is a new conversation for us and so everyone doesn't necessarily understand like what the ask is what all of the different labels and certifications mean what people really care about lighting designers are looking for products that have material ingredient reporting and the ability to quickly filter search for them we want to see products that are free of toxic materials or at least with the minimum amount possible i think one of the biggest challenges is access to information right now it's a little tricky because we're not able to find three equals for a lot of products. Um, so if we are able to find one product with a declare label or HPD, we might find two equivalents, but they're missing the documentation. So the tricky part is capturing that information on the schedule, making sure that that comes in through your submittals and that the commitment isn't just verbalized, but it's seen through to completion. The Lighting Advocacy Letter is a venue for designers to come together as a unified voice to make a big ask of the manufacturing community to provide more transparency around their products so that we can make more informed decisions in our designs. The first steps you can take in lighting practice is to familiarize yourself with the initiatives that are ongoing. So read the LAL, the Lighting Advocacy Letter, sign if it's a commitment that you feel alignment with, download the toolkit, familiarize yourself with what practices are being recommended right now, and share that message with your colleagues, team members, and others working on your projects. We have always been a mission-based company. We've always been driven by that. So the idea of taking big problems and breaking them down into actionable pieces is just in our DNA. One of the hurdles is, is that prioritization. I'm saying, what are we going to do first? Are we going to have you know, net zero operations? Or is the better opportunity to come up with less toxic materials, even non-toxic materials, have a long life? So you can think of something like a gasket, you know, that you know, you want to last for a period of time, but is never going to be biodegradable. And there's opportunity people making them out of organic material now. So if you can get something as simple as a gasket, which we use miles of, is that the right place? So is it materials? Is it operations? Is it design for disassembly? The simple things that you could do is identify packaging, weight of your product. I mean, you don't have to come up with a brand new luminaire idea, but you can make it 
a half a pound versus a pound. You just have to be very deliberate and think about that. You have to also challenge some of the existing paradigms. And you know, at some point you have to say, why do you need 20 gauge steel? Why can't 24, you know, somebody in 1953 decided it had to be 20 gauge steel and nobody's questioned it. So I think we have to, as an industry, say, what can we change? Sustainability is not too hard, it's not too complex. It depends on where you are looking at it from. I believe there are parts of it, yes, that get incredibly complex and technical, and that's where we have people that specialize and focus in that. And honestly, we need people you know, focusing on that no matter what career path you sit in. You know, there should be this base knowledge of understanding and that we should make that so it's not a complex thing to understand that it's, you know, really just making sure you understand some of the small behavioral changes that you make, flipping a light switch on and off, right? And the impact that can have. And I think it's important to weave those into all subject matter as well so that people understand the connection no matter what path that you take or what subject matter you're learning, sustainability has a connection to it. Great things are happening, but we've got to continue to test those. Um, we've got to continue to drive demand for them so that they become more and more readily available. Not everybody comes to us with a well-defined sustainability goal, and that's okay. We're there to help them through that process. So sometimes it's modifying our vocabulary and how we talk about sustainability, uh, especially if sustainability isn't put forward as a primary goal. We can often link it to um, economic goals. We can uh, link it to social goals. We can link it to uh, retention and recruitment goals. Part of it, our job is to educate them as to how sustainable strategies and high performance design can really improve their lives and their experience in their spaces. When you make these commitments that we're making around sustainability, one of the biggest parts of your carbon footprint is your buildings, your building portfolio, um, and the operations of those facilities. We've created six of our own zero energy spaces, and we've got a couple more coming on the way, and we continue to do those for clients, and we've seen an uptick in client requests and that's not just from a perspective of saving the environment from less emissions. It's also becoming more affordable uh, for them to operate that way. And it's driving resiliency. You no longer have to depend on the grid system. ESG, environmental, social, and governance, has been proven statistically to help companies perform better economically and operationally. I believe that that transition of financial funding in the investment world to show that there is massive leverage is what's really helping us make the transition now. There's a lot of different places that are pushing on the movement that we have today. There are now more than ever governments that are signing on to commitments and uh, mandates and driving powers like you know, the Paris Climate Accord and C40. Um, net zero, there's just tons you know, of commitment paths that are coming out there now for not just governments, but then also companies as well. And so we're seeing this movement of commitments and measurements and based on real data. Demand is, is really continuously created from us coming together and making a decision collectively that we want to make change implementing that change and then continuing to try to drive it over and over and over. I truly believe that continuing to drive towards more collaborative contractual methods where design partner, owner, and contractor are all starting the process together through concept will drive the best outcome in the result of a project in creating a high performing building. have to keep talking about this. Take the initiative to become aware. Take the initiative to get involved in organizations that are trying to move the needle forward. Take the initiative to educate your folks internally. Educate yourself. Understand what the problem is, understand what the potential solutions are, and understand what your role can be in making a difference. We have forums. Um, through organizations like American Institute of Architects, American Society of Interior Designers, 
where we do come together to exchange information and ideas. But I think it has to be a little bit more transparent if we're gonna make real strides as an industry. We need more transparency so we understand how things are made, how they're processed, so that we can make improvements. This is an opportunity to work together, share information, and take this journey faster. We need research and development um, to come together as a collaborative thing, right? And the more that we can understand everybody's perspectives and roadblocks, I believe the more progress we'll be able to make together in the long run. If we all try to do it on our own, it's only gonna slow us down, and there's gonna be too much trial and error. We need to learn from each other, we need to commit to this, and we need to do it now. As a greater design community, we have a lot of power to advocate for change. And I think the more we wake up to how much influence we actually have, the more quickly we're gonna see this momentum build. In some ways, some damage is irreversible, but it's not too late. I'm most optimistic about our ability to meet the challenge because I believe the human race is pretty resilient. I think we have a once in a generation opportunity to redirect the way we are doing things as an industry. We can't squander it. We have to move forward. It's time for all of us to lift our voices together. Add your voice to the conversation. Get involved and make this a priority. Receive the light and be the light. So receive the light meaning like really acknowledging the personal power that each of us has and then be the light where we, we stand tall and we do the hard things and we take those small steps each day to work towards the world that we all want to live in.